A warm welcome and good morning. Uh, we're thankful again that we are able to gather in person. And we thank God for that and let's just hope it remains that way. Uh, this morning is going to be a little bit different in that um, we'll be exploring some of the verses and we'll refer to those as we go through our, our sermon this morning. Um, but I will... I would like us. I'm going to read you something um, that I write down, and I'd like us to. Now I'm ready to go. Imagine you were sitting on the edge of the river, and and the water is it's quite torrent, and you notice somebody falling into that river and struggling to swim struggling to swim back to safety. Obviously, you're shocked, you, you become anxious, and at that moment, somebody else dives into the water and saves that person. But unfortunately, in the process of saving him or her, they drown. How would you feel? Um, I'm imagining if... I was to answer that myself, for myself I would be amazed at this act of heroism. I would be glad that the person survived, was saved. At the same time I would be saddened by the death of the hero. We'll come back to that towards the end of the sermon. We have God's word. This is a documentation of what God spoke and through the ages several authors have written it down and we have it today God's word in Hebrews the first chapter the first couple of verses it said that God spoke to us in various times and in various ways in the beginning it was through the prophets and then in the last days it spoke to us through our Lord Jesus Christ and among the many themes that we see in the Bible, one that sort of stands out quite predominantly, it's quite dominant, it sort of hits you in the face, you can't avoid it, is how man disobeys God's word. And it's a constant battle, God talking and man disobeying, not listening. God's persisting though. And it keeps persisting to this day until such time when he will bring an end to this. And he will keep on talking. And he will keep on calling out in the hope that somebody will stop and listen and take heed what God is saying to us. And allow his word to have an impact in our lives. And we know, and we've, you know, the theme is constant, how sin had brought that, that, that separation between man and God but also at the same time how God is constantly trying to reach out to us. If we go back in the Garden of Eden when everything was fine, everything was perfect, the way God had created it, and the pinnacle of his, of his creation was man that was formed in his own image. He spoke and everything else happened. You and I were actually formed by his hands. He actually put effort in there. He, he, he got the dust and he moulded us in his, in, in, you know, to look like him, if you like. Gee, I hope he doesn't look like me, but anyway. And he breathed into us life. That's what separates us from the rest of the, um, the uh, creation. And so we had a relationship with him. We read that he used to come down and he will have fellowship with mankind, if I can put it that way, with Adam and Eve. Um, and we know because of sin, because Adam did disobey God, Eve was tempted and God's honour was offended and that created the separation. And ever since when God went down on that faithful day and we were hiding because of the guilt and shame that sin brings upon us. 
God was calling out, and, uh, and some of us are a, bit, a little bit older, would remember that song by um, Don Francisco. Thank you. Thank you. I knew it was going to... Adam, where are you? And that, that, that calling still resonates to this day because God is constantly calling out to people in every which way he's calling today. He called somebody, a neighbour who heard the word of God on the streets, in a village, in a mountain, it doesn't matter where, God is constantly, and through various ways, he's calling out to people to listen to him. And I ask myself the question, how does one, how does someone reconcile, rather, how does one deal with the guilt and shame that we carry because of sin? How do we deal with it? We can dismiss it, but we know the effects of it. You can dismiss the fact that sin rules the world. But we cannot dismiss its impact. We cannot dismiss the results of it. It's there in the front. We live it every day and it's all around us. How do we reconcile and restore that really lost relationship that we once had back in the Garden of Eden? How can... And you look at yourself and you think, how can I come in the presence of God in the sinful state that man is? We can't. It's simple as that. And we never will be able to. The Bible... God's word takes sin very, very seriously. And I thank God for his word, because I wouldn't have been aware of it. I'll be trying to rationalise what's happening here and why things are happening the way they are and why through the history of mankind we have all these wars and troubles and, 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 and hatred and killings and, 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 and jealousies and, and, and you can add and, add and add to that. Well, now I know why if I'm willing to open up my ears and my eyes to listen to what God has to tell me and to tell me why this is happening. This is why God gave us his word to help become aware of our fallen state. And sin, sin is not like, yeah, we often tell it, oh, you, know, you did something wrong, that's, that's a sin. But sin is more than that, more than just doing something wrong. It, it, it came as, as a betrayal of God's trust, of not trusting what he tells us, of not listening and accepting what he's telling us, denying that what he's telling us is the truth. Sin, sin is, is what brings us into a state of alienation with God our creator. And, man, and as I said before, man demonstrates this on a daily basis and will be none the wiser if it wasn't for God to tell me, listen, open up your eyes, this is why these things are happening around you. And we'll be none the wiser because he sent the Holy Spirit that, as Jesus said, convicts mankind of sin. It opens up their eyes and realises, hang on a minute, this is who I am. I spoke here earlier before in the Greek and I used the term, we look at sin, katamutra. In other words, face on. You can't avoid it. I can try and avoid it, but when God stands in front of me and he shows me exactly who I am, where am I going to go and hide? And we should be thankful for that. We should be thankful because it gives us the opportunity to do something about it. So I can have the first verse up there, guys. Psalm 51. Well-known psalm. And we know the reasons why David wrote the psalm. Because of sin. Have mercy upon me, O God, according to your loving kindness, according to the multitude of your tender mercies. Blot out my transgression. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. See, and this is a classic case. David, he, it's very hard to rationalise, but did he know that what he did was quite wrong? Or did he just dismiss it? Yeah, okay, it's not that bad or whatever. Isn't this how we rationalise things in our lives sometimes? And then comes Nathan and says, man, 
you are wrong. You have offended God. You have sinned. And what was the response? And this is what's important. How we respond to God's word. How do we respond when God reveals to us? Hey, be careful. Sin is knocking at the door. David was touched by this. He didn't try to excuse it, but he fell on his knees and he prayed to God, which shows another thing. God's mercy. He knew that he was at God's mercy. He, at a, in another instance, he says, I'd rather fall at the mercy of God rather than the, the non-mercy of men. He knew that at God he had a chance to survive. At the hands of men, none. We remember Isaiah, and you read that in chapter 6 of his book, when Isaiah, he didn't sin. He was just a man trying to do God's work, being a prophet. But he finds himself standing in front of the glory of God. And you read that in chapter 6 and, and, and the scene opens and there we see the, the throne, the glory of his holy God. And there was Isaiah. And there's this you and me just standing in front of God's glory and thinking, wow, wow, wow is me from a man of unclean lips. I'm done. I'm kaput, if you like. I'm dead. How can I survive this? But God's not here. As Jesus said, I did not come to condemn the world. I came to save it. And God does an act there with the angel, picks up the, uh, the coal, and he burns it as a, as, a, as a mark of cleansing to make us right to be able to stand in front of God. The problem of sin is, as Paul tells us, it's global. Nobody's immune to it. For all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Adam and Eve, they were good-natured people, weren't they? I would imagine. They were nice people, like a lot of us are. And often we compare our goodness to the badness of others. And gee, we're not that bad. We're pretty good. But so was Adam and Eve. And all they did was just not trust in God's word. But that was enough to offend God. That was enough to not be able to get away from God's word. And this is the thing about God's word. It cannot be altered. It cannot change. It does not waver. God said, the minute you disobey me, you shall surely die. They didn't have to go down that track. They didn't have to entertain Satan's uh, uh, lies. But you know what? Yeah, he might be right. Yeah, it, it, it doesn't sound that bad. Offending God's trust is bad. And we only come face to face when we read God's word. Then we can see where we each stand. If this, is a, this is not to do with me judging you, you judging me. This is you and me standing in front of God's word. Just as we spoke a few weeks ago with that uh, adulterous woman. It was her and Jesus. And nobody else. And nobody else. If you were to study um, Romans chapter 6, 7 and 8, it's interesting. And it, it Take the time. I know it can get a little bit complex at times. But Paul there almost, in, in, I'm not sure if the terminology is right, but personalises sin as, a, as, as an entity with power. And it's true because Satan is, is, is the father of sin. And it talks about a waging war that we have within us. Even as Christians, that our bodies are subject to sin. And we constantly, there's a constant battle between what we, and, and this is why Paul says, I know what's right, I want to do what's right, but I don't have the ability to do what's right. I'm done, I'm gone, and how am I supposed to, what a conundrum. How am I supposed to survive now? How, when, when my body says go this way and my mind says go that way. But he finds a way. Because God revealed to him that in Jesus he has victory. And he chooses it because he says, and do not, 
Did I read the chapter? Yeah. And do not let sin reign in your mortal bodies, and do not obey in, the, in its lust, and do not present yourselves as instruments of unrighteousness. Now, in the Greek, it's a verb which is a continuous thing. Let's not think that, okay, yeah, I came to God, I believe in Jesus, he died for my sins, um, that's it. I'm, I'm safe now. Your soul, the spirit is saved. It understands exactly what's going on. But then you've got the battle of the flesh pulling one way. And it's a constant battle. And Paul says, just be careful. Just be careful because this is the war that is raging within you. And you need to be aware of this. You have the power through prayer, through meditation. Yes, you will fall. Yes, I will make a mistake. Yes, I will stumble. But as I said, God always provides a way of reconciling that. Because if we say we are with our sin, we're liars. But even when we do sin, John says in chapter 1 of his first epistle, even if we do sin and we ask for forgiveness, he is willing and able to do so. So this is the battle. This is, this is how God, through his word, is re revealing to us what's happening around us. Let alone what Paul writes in Ephesians about the battle with those forces that we can't even see, the world around us and that is governed by Satan. And there's a, a contrast to that because, and this, and I remember somebody asked me once, um, you know, they sin and how is God going to deal with this now? And, you know, we were having a conversation. And the first thing I said to him, how did you know it was a sin? What makes you think that what you did it wasn't that terrible anyway, but he felt that it was wrong, and it was wrong, but what, what made, brought him to the realisation that I offended God? He goes, well, I said, maybe it was the Holy Spirit. Maybe this is the battle that you are going through. Don't think for one moment that God has forsaken you. Satan would like you to think that. Oh, gee, you've fallen. You made a mistake. You've sinned here. God doesn't want you. You offended him. You're gone. No. This is the constant battle that we have. The fact that I was aware that something was wrong is because of God's working in my soul, in my life. And this is something that we should take comfort in. That he is always making provisions in order for us to be able to stand where he wants us to stand. Because it's not easy. And to be aware that the flesh is weak. To be conscious about the decisions we make, where we go and what we do and what we say and all those things. And as I said, when we do fall, we can go, come back to God and we can regroup and continue on our journey with him. As I said, the Bible takes sin very, very seriously. Um, and sin is what built that barrier between man and God. The problem is we build that barrier, we build that wall, and the problem is that we cannot bring it down. And as, as I was thinking about this last night, uh, Germany, after the war, they built the wall that uh, divided Berlin. Well, eventually came the time, I can't remember in the 90s, uh, with um, uh, Gorbachev and whatever, that they eventually brought the wall down. They built it, they brought it down. The wall of China was built back whenever it was built, and that's slowly decaying. That's coming down. That was to, to, um, you know, to uh, stop the enemies from, uh, from uh, crossing over. If you've been to England, you might have come across the um, Hadrian's Wall. We actually, we actually saw it, and what did we see? Did you? Simon, what did we see? It was just a small part of it. And this is a wall that they built from coast to coast, and yet only just a few spots here and there are visible. It came down. That doesn't... That does, the, those walls come down. But the wall, the sin that we help build up, we cannot bring down. And this is the other message that we see in God's word, that God has dealt with that issue as well. God has dealt with the problem of sin. He's dealt with the problem of separation. He's dealt with the problem that David and Paul had. He dealt with the problem that Isaiah felt. He deals with the problem that I had, with that you had, and maybe you still have. I don't know. But if you do, and you're still struggling, maybe you're still facing that issue of alienation from God, God is still calling out to you. 
and he will persistently and consistently keep on calling out to you until such time when there is no more time. And that's why Paul says in earnest, now that you hear these words, don't harden your heart. Do not harden your heart. Because we don't know what tomorrow is going to bring. So how did God bring about this redemption? How did God bring about breaking down that wall that separates us from God? I want to go back a little bit to Israel. Um, in the process of providing salvation to mankind, God selected a certain people, the Israelites, and they become a nation. And when you read the Old Testament, one thing stands out. Sacrifices. God had commanded, we see that it was part of the, the Jewish life. Um, it was something that separated them from the rest of the, uh, the, uh, the pagan tribes and, 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 and peoples of, of the day. And he wanted them to do certain sacrifices. Um, and when you look at it, it was a way of the believer, the Israelite, to be able to come in the presence of God, because otherwise he couldn't. And it was very specific on how things should be done. As a matter of fact, if you go to the book of Leviticus, the whole book is dedicated on how sacrifices should be made, when they should be made, for what reasons they should be made, and who should be making them. Very, very precise. A whole book. Now, how many of you have read Leviticus? It sort of reminds me of the time back in the youth group back years ago. You remember Phil when uh, Delhi asked us how many of us read Jeremiah, it was Jeremiah, wasn't it? And I think about half a dozen ha hands, the rest of us hadn't. So we all went back and started reading Jeremiah. Well, I asked you, how many of us read Le Leviticus? I have to say, I've read it, but once I've read it, that was it. And when I went, last night I went back to it and I was looking and I saw, my goodness. All that God had commanded within Leviticus, and this is not the time to, I mean, it would be nice at some stage. Maybe we can do that next month when they the Jews celebrate Um, Kip um Kippa, uh, Kapir, Kippur. Nick, I'm looking at you because you know this. Yom Kippur, yeah, when they celebrate the, the Day of Atonement. See, the whole purpose for the sacrifices was the atonement. Atonement. We'll come to that in a second. And as I said, um, the sacrifices weren't new to, uh, to the Israelites. We see Moses going to Pharaoh and says, listen, can you let my people go into the wilderness so we can offer sacrifices? So it was something that they were doing. It wasn't documented, but it's something that they were doing. We can even go further back and we read that Cain and Abel were doing, giving offerings and sacrifices from back then. But we can go even further back in the Garden of Eden where we see, I believe, the first sacrifice ever done. When after Adam and Eve sinned and they were, the guilt and the shame forced them to hide from God. God says, listen, come out of hiding. I will cover you and cover your nakedness, your shamefulness. I will cover it. So they will see the first sacrifice. And now we come forward and, um, and we see the commandments that God gave um, to the Israelites to perform these rituals. And, and when you think about it, the Israelis were, in a miraculous way, freed from Egypt. So they were refugees. When they were going through, through um, um, uh, the desert, and they were there for 40 years, on their way to where God had promised them, despite all the, uh, all the problems that they created, and again they disobeyed and all these people, but God had persisted because he's true to his word, you will get to the land of Canaan, you will get to the promised land, if you obey my word. So whoever obeys my word will be there. That's it. The rest of us is hard task to obey his word. So he, 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 he grabs this bunch of um, um, uh, refugees, if you like, and then after that he starts giving them commandments. This is what you should do. This is what you shouldn't do. Um, and in some way reflecting God's moral character onto his people that separated them from everybody else around them. 
and that this one true God that saved, that, 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 um, that saved him out of the bondage of Egypt has, has done these marvellous things in this, with his people and they're on their way to where God had promised them that they will finally rest. You know, as I was thinking about this again, um, we all get hung up sometimes about rules and regulations and the laws and stuff like that. And again, it's not the time to talk about these things, but I'll put it this way. And I've written down here, law, law is put in the context, when put in the context of God's desire to have fellowship with us, it takes on a new perspective. The law said, if you want to come to my presence, you need to sacrifice before you are able to come to my presence. God is making provisions for, for us to have fellowship with him. But I can't just rock up like that. I can't just say, hey, God, you're home? I'm coming in for a coffee. It doesn't work that way. God is holy. I am not. He is just. I am not. How on earth am I going to go in? This is, but I will make that provision for you. You can do it. All you have to do is just offer the sacrifice which will cover your sin and then you can come into my presence. How's that? Will that work for you? Works for me, God will say. So God institutes this process for the Israelites to be able to come before God. And he's very, he was very strict in the way that uh, they had to um, perform this because we see that when they did something wrong, the, uh, the, uh, the, the sons of Aaron... God condemned him, killed him. He said, no, 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 that's not what I asked. You did it all wrong. You need to obey what I'm telling you. It was very strict. But the whole essence of what we read in the book of Leviticus is that word atonement. Not surprisingly, in the book of Leviticus, it's written down, it depends on the translations, of course, 49 times as opposed to the rest of the Old Testament, 31 times. So in one book, a lot more than what the whole Testament talks about, atonement, which always relates to sacrifice. You can see where this is going. And in the New Testament, only four times, which is a bit surprising, but the whole theme of the, whole, of the New Testament is based on God's atonement for us through Jesus Christ. It uses words, I think it's only four times, uh, and it uses the words exileosis a couple of times and ilazmos a couple of times as well. But the crux of it is based on those sacrifices and God accepting us because of a sacrifice that covers our sin. It's as simple as that. To cover atonement is to cover, to appease, and usually to appease a God, to make payment for sin, to turn God's wrath or wrath away, to remove the guilt, and as a result, and as a as a, as a as a result, it paves the way to reconciliation. That had to take place first, the sacrifice, before reconciliation could take place. Before you can come to me, God says, "Who's going to pay for the debt?" Before you become just, who's going to make you just enough for you to be able to come and stand in my presence? How are you going to do that? No. So it was the process of our justification through substitution. The process of our justification through substitution. In other words, I could not justify myself, but somebody else takes, substitutes me that is able to do it, and therefore I'm able to come and stand and have fellowship with God. What gives the right for us to stand before God? We don't have any rights. If God demands justice, how on earth are we going to do justice when we have sinned? And to stand in front of God, and the Bible says that you, know, you cannot look upon God and, and live unless there's something in between. Unless there's something that substitutes me that God is accepting. And so it is me. And that's why the sacrifices, in some ways, were substituting themselves so God can accept it.
all of what took place, and if we can have the next verse, please. All that took place back in, in the days. That's why I say that, you know, you, you, yeah, Leviticus, you read it once and, and that's it. But you read, and everything that God has commanded points to one thing. And Paul writes about this. In 11.14, is that right? Yep, here we go. And every priest stands in ministry daily. Oh, sorry, 14. For by one offering he is perfected forever, those who are being sanctified. But the Holy Spirit also witnessed to us, for after he has said before, this is the covenant that I will make with them for those days, says the Lord. I will put my laws into their hearts. In their minds I will write them, he says, and as their sin and their lawless deeds I will remember no more. Now there is a remission of these. There is no longer an offering for sin. So what they were doing, they had to do it this constantly. And as I said, it would be nice at some stage to do a bit of a study on what actually transpired through all of those different um, sacrifices. Um, but, and they had to do it you know, constantly, and especially the, uh, the Day of Atonement was once a year, which is celebrated in the Jewish community in uh, September. Um, but the whole idea was that, that Christ now does it once and for all. Um, it's not up there but in the same chapter for the law having a shadow of the good things to come and not the very image of the things can never with these same sacrifices which they offer continually year by year make those who approach the perfect and then it goes on to say about if the blood, the sacrifices can't really take the sin away but it was a process of being able to make the sinner, the Israelite, to be able to come to God at, at the tabernacle or at the temple later on. But those sacrifices, our Lord Jesus Christ's sacrifices, paves the way to reconciliation. If we can have the next verse, please, Romans, and we started reading this before. I usually mark my part, but I didn't this time. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Being justified, and this is where those sacrifices came in, justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God set forth as a propitiation. There's another word for atonement, for covering us for replacing our sin by his blood through faith to demonstrate his righteousness because in his forbearance God had passed over the sins that were previously committed and to demonstrate at the present time his righteousness that he might, might be just and the justifier is the one who has faith in Jesus. So the sacrifice takes place first, then the reconciliation happens, then the atonement happens. Jesus now is our substitute. He covers us. He has deflected God's wrath. On that cross, when Jesus died, he suffered the wrath of God. He suffered the death and the pain and the indignity upon that cross. He suffered to the point where he couldn't bear it anymore. He suffered alienation, albeit momentarily, from his father. Oh God, oh God, why have you forsaken me? What a, when you think about it, when you think about it, what he did for us, that he has suffered so much that he became ill. This is what we should be doing. This is what we should have suffered. And I ask the question, but why the sacrifice? Why the death, the killing and the shedding of blood? Couldn't just God say, listen, this is how things are. Do you believe it or you don't believe it? Yeah, I believe it. Okay, your sins are forgiven. It's God. Why not? Why not do that? Wouldn't it make it a lot more simpler? Why did he have to go and see his son be slaughtered like a lamb? 
There's certain godly principles that we cannot avoid. Paul says that without the sacrifice, which involves death and blood, there is no remission. It has to be paid for. It can't just be paid by words. There's a debt. The debt. You can't say, you know, go to the, the bank and say, listen, I owe you so much money, but you know what? How about we just let it go? I feel good enough. It might be, but I doubt it. And there's another principle. We read that in Hebrews as well. That for every, uh, Paul says that for every transgression and disobedience, there's a just reward. We can't avoid it. It's the law of life, if you like. Death needs to be paid. The wrong needs to be corrected. It's not enough to say, I just forgive. Wouldn't that be diminishing? Wouldn't that be diminishing the power of sin? The destructive power of sin? Wouldn't that go be going against but you God, you said if you disobey, you shall surely die. You know, we humans, we 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 you know don't like them when there's injustice made. And we demand, demand, you know, we demand from the governments, from the laws, that the justice be made because, you know, he did this wrong and they, should not be, they shouldn't get away. How many times have we read the newspapers and we read about things and we always say, oh, well, you shouldn't be getting away with this? We demand justice. And none of us are just to demand justice, but we do. Because, that's, you know, we want some law and order, which is fine. But what about God? What about God? Without recompense, without somebody paying the debt, the debt will always remain. Sin brought death and suffering. Don't you think that it requires suffering and death to compensate? An eye for an eye, if you like, a tooth for a tooth. And that's exactly what happened. But through sin, death and suffering came upon us. And then through the grace of God, for the love of God that gave his only son upon the cross, who suffered and then died. But it doesn't stop there because the victory, that was paid. The sin, the debt was paid. Okay? That's paid off. That's fantastic. What's the next step? Payment has been done. Justice has been served. How do we know that? Through his resurrection. The reason why God resurrected Jesus is to say, now that the debt has been paid, you have been justified. Paved the way for you and I to be able to go to God. That's why Paul in Corinthians, and we read this at every funeral, oh death, where is your sting? Oh haze, where is your victory? The sting of death is sin, and the strength of the sin is the law. But thanks be to God, and indeed, thanks be to God, who gives us victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. And that was made possible, as I said, through his resurrection. And here's the paradox. Jesus didn't have to die. Did he? What did he do wrong? He didn't do anything wrong. Jesus did not do anything wrong. He did not deserve to die. And what was he going to gain? He doesn't need anything. If we take it, you know, in our human way, our rationale. Does he need anything? Is he missing anything? This is God. But such was his love for his creation. Yes, he if you like, misses us. He wants us to come back home. He wants us to have fellowship with him. He knows that we can't do nothing to gain his favour except for accepting his son who is our atonement. And I think I've missed a verse. Can you tell me what's what's the next verse up there? I think it was quite important. When you read this, and I'll read it with you here. Now all things are of God who has reconciled us to himself through through Jesus Christ and has given us the ministry of reconciliation. 
That is, and note this, and let it resonate in our minds and in our bodies, that God was in Christ, reconciling the world to himself, not imputing the trespasses to them, and has committed us to the word of reconciliation. He didn't impart the, the, the judgment upon us, but he put it upon Jesus Christ, his son, God. It's hard to fathom. It's hard to understand. We just accept it by faith that this is what he's done for us. This is the extent of his love. It's just purely out of love. How do we respond to his... And I'm getting close to finishing. When we stand at the foot of the cross and we sing those wonderful hymns and we stand in awe and wonderment for the love that he has shown us and we love him for it. We love him dearly because he loved us first. Paul also talks about a transformation that takes place, the renewal of our mind. We walk in a different way. We walk with the mind of Christ now albeit in our smallness and we can be not very wise at times and uh, we, we make our mistakes and everything and he knows that. He talks about the newness of life that we're walking. So I'll close now with what I started with. So imagine you're on the bank, the, the river, and somebody fell in. Somebody dives in to save the person. He saves them. And the process dies. How do you respond to that? Let me ask you this. Let me ask myself this. How would you respond to that if it was you that was drowning? May God bless his word. And always to keep us reminding us through his word, through the Holy Spirit, to keep on reminding us of who we are and who he is and the love that we will never be able to rationalise and understand, but we accept, and we allow it to transform our lives for his glory. Amen.